When I look at this building, I think about the thousands of people who have climbed these stairs over the years. People of great faith, people who had sinned, people who were lost or hungry or sick, people who were made to be there, people who chose to be there. When a church reaches a milestone, there is an opportunity to honor those who have made contributions to its mission, whether they are grandiose gestures or quiet ones few people see. The lives of those that have been touched and enriched by the church can be celebrated as well. And to reflect on where a parish has been allows it the opportunity to understand where it is today and perhaps guide where it can be tomorrow. This is a story about people with faith to move mountains, people with courage to dedicate their lives to serve a greater cause, and people with love to help children, their neighbors, the sick, and the poor. And this is a story about the parish that connects them all, the rock that anchors the community that has weathered the crashing waves of time. For St. Elizabeth of Hungary is now 100 years a parish. Our story begins in 1207 with the patroness herself, who was born into royalty in Hungary to King Andrew II and his wife Gertrude. It is said that her first word was a prayer. At the age of four, when her sweetness of character was such that people in other countries had heard of her, she was sent 350 miles from home to Wartburg Castle in Germany, where she was betrothed to 11-year-old Ludwig, the son of a powerful German duke. She was married at the age of 14, and she and Ludwig were deeply devoted to each other. They had three children, and Elizabeth led a life of prayer, sacrifice, and service to the poor and sick. She lived during a time when the combined disasters of climate, war, and poverty caused great suffering, and became devoted to helping those who had nowhere to turn. It is said that one day, as Ludwig was returning to the castle, he met Elizabeth carrying food under her cloak. But she opened it to show him that she carried not bread, but the most beautiful red and white roses. After six years of marriage, her husband died in the Crusades, and his family, who did not approve of her charitable works, banished her from the castle. Yet she only became more devout, living a life of exceptional poverty and humility, continuing to care for the poor in a hospital she founded in honor of recently deceased St. Francis. Elizabeth refused to defend herself against the unjust accusations of others, feeling that to defend herself would mean breaking the law of love as written in her heart. She died before her 24th birthday in 1231. Her tremendous popularity resulted in her canonization by Pope Gregory IX four years later, and St. Elizabeth became the patron saint of bakers, death of children, the falsely accused, hospitals, and the homeless. Six hundred years later, in the 1830s, Germany was again embroiled in political strife and the first wave of German immigration began its descent upon the United States. Beginning perhaps as early as the 30s or early 1840s, um, uh, Germans started coming. Um, a lot was going on in Germany. Among the dynamics were the breaking up of the old principalities and the building over time of a new German nation dominated by Prussia. And that meant all kinds of unsettling things going on in Germany. In addition to that, in German-speaking Europe, there was a season of liberal revolutions. Um, 1848 is the major focus. And so that failed revolution of 1848 
spewed off, maybe not the best choice of words, but flung off uh, another set of liberal, progressive, anti-clerical, somewhat anti-monarchical, uh, pro-freedom of new thought and ideas kind of, um, kind of immigrants. So there were dynamics. There were reactions to Prussia. Uh, Prussians increasing dominance in the German principalities are the multiple German states that by 1870 will lead to the creation of the nation Germany. Germany is a latecomer to the family of nations and so therefore that was, there was reaction to that. No one wanted to be drafted into the Prussian army or very, very few people whose loyalties had been much, much more local much, much more principality or local German state. And so there were reactions to that. So there were refugees from the failed revolutions of 1848. And so that's part of the dynamic. This caused people to come, um, apart from seeking broader opportunity and seeing uh, the emerging America as a, as a fertile ground for economic opportunity. And so as a result, we had immigration 1830s to 1870 into the 1880s. I think that's the period. Who came? Uh, a lot of German Catholics, a bunch. And by the way, the Germans were the largest single immigrant group in the 19th century to Louisville. The Germans tended to settle in the 1840s, into the 50s, toward East Downtown generally. Shelby Street becomes an, 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 a symbol for me for German immigration. Germans came, they settled toward East Downtown, um, St. Boniface, um, the German Protestant Church, the German Methodist Church, all East Market Street. Um, um, so along and near the Shelby Street corridor. So East Downtown was the center of that first German immigration. By the mid-1850s, it's East Chestnut Street with the Ursuline Sisters and St. Martin's Church. And then you keep heading out Shelby Street until the 1870s, 80s, you're at Shelby and Oak Street with St. Vincent de Paul. And with the 1880s and 90s, you're at St. Elizabeth of Hungary Church uh, around on, um, on East Burnett in the Schnitzelberg area. So that corridor, it seems to me, served as, a, as an important image of German immigration and German migration along the Shelby Street corridor over time. In 1905, the right Reverend William George McCloskey was nearing the end of his life and his 40-year tenure as the Bishop of Louisville. This zealous and controversial bishop, who introduced to the diocese many religious orders, including the Little Sisters of the Poor and the Benedictines, will have founded a total of 64 churches. The growth of the parochial schools was chiefly the product of his zeal. The number of children attending them increased from 2,000 in 1868 when he began to 12,000 at the time of his death in 1909. Among one of the last churches and schools he founded began when he sent a letter to a 42-year-old assistant at St. Martin's Church on December the 12th, 1905. The Bishop of Louisville was commissioning the German-born priest to establish the parish of St. Elizabeth of Hungary on property already acquired on Burnett Avenue. The new parish, carved out of the St. Vincent de Paul Parish, was to sit squarely in the middle of Louisville's recently populated community, Schnitzelberg. The neighborhood was quickly populated by a wave of second-generation German Catholics whose parents had immigrated from Germany during the latter part of the 1800s. My name is Martin Joseph Harney. I was baptized at St. Joseph's Church up on Washington Street uh -huh. in 1906. Mm -hmm. And uh, my uh, father and mother, they, they were from Aust Austria. Uh -huh. And I was the first child that was born here. And I was the 13th child. My birthday is May the 28th, 1908. I will be 95 this year on the 28th of May. 
The new pastor of St. Elizabeth's, Father James J. Ossent, went into action immediately. He moved to the St. Vincent de Paul Rectory, appointed committees, and engaged the architectural firm of D. X. Murphy and Brothers. By March the 6th, 1906, the cornerstone of the new combination church and school was laid. Construction continued through the summer and into the fall. Father was an architect almost, because he designed the church. He helped design the church? Yes, Father Austin. Is that right? He, um, he, he took a lot from St. Martin's. Mm -hmm. If you see the two and compare them, you see little things that break in. Now, it wasn't as, no, on that such a scale because it was the beginning of a parish. But it was a beautiful um, church when it was built for St. Elizabeth's. Politics would have been democratic. The dominant culture would have been Roman Catholic. There would have been authority in the schools, um, discipline in the schools. There would have been the dominance of the priest in the neighborhood culture. Um, there would have been an emphasis, I think, fairly on work and neatness. I think those are values that have continued to this day in that neighborhood. I think the Schnitzelberg neighborhood had uh, the streetcar, and it circled around, and the, the people who lived within that circle and were just a block or two from that streetcar street car line, no matter where they were, that that was very influential to set up a neighborhood and give it an identity. And uh, where I grew up, we never had that. We never had that, uh, uh, togetherness that you saw over here in the Schnitzelberg area. On September the 2nd, 1906, the combination church and school building was dedicated by Bishop Mikulski and the pastor who spent the past nine months overseeing the birth of St. Elizabeth of Hungary at last offered his first mass. The ceremonies continued into the afternoon. The following morning, as a full moon was setting in the west, St. Elizabeth's School opened its doors to 200 students. Located on the second floor above the church, the school was stabbed by the Ursuline Sisters of the Immaculate Conception. The principal was Sister Mary Alphonse. Within four years, the rectory and convent were built. Meanwhile, the world was on the verge of war in Europe and the motherland was the aggressor. Eventually, the United States got involved, and the impact on the German-American communities was massive and indelible. For the folks of Germantown and Schnitzelberg, World War I was more painful, more painful than World War II. The only reason I say that is that there was, there was still a more blatant form of German-ness and I don't know exactly what I mean by that, but certainly more subscribers to the German language newspaper, the Einsiker, and there had been many, many other simultaneous German publications in the community, literary magazines, um, German Catholic newspapers, German Protestant newspapers, German newspapers generally. And so just there would have been, I think, the badge of Germanness, even the accent on dad or granddad's voice, or even perhaps even the kids. There would have been a, an identity that would have been German, that would have been much more blatant in the World War I era. And so therefore there would have been more suspicion and more uh, uh, the dominant English speaking culture that was siding with Great Britain, siding with England again. Um, it would have been, would have created more tension and hardship in the German families of the neighborhood. Um, and there gets going to be played out again in public policy. You want something to argue about? Here's one. Will the Board of Education continue, continue to teach German in the schools? 
and there was a knockdown, drag out debate during World War I over whether it was appropriate to teach the enemy language. You see, we had the World War yeah. I. My sister started the first grade there. Uh -huh. She had German. Mm -hmm. When I go two years later, and it was taken out. Oh. They quit uh, teaching German when I went to St. Elizabeth back in 1913. After eight years, the growth of the parish made necessary a larger church and more room for the school children. The cornerstone of the present beautiful building was laid on August the 9th, 1914, and the completed building dedicated almost exactly one year later, on August the 8th, 1915. The entire facilities of the first building were then used for the school. Designed and built by architect Fred Earhart, St. Elizabeth's Church is significant as one of the finest classical revival churches in Louisville. It incorporates elements of the Italian Renaissance and the English Baroque in an imaginative interpretation of the classical revival mode. Earhart also built St. Therese, which is probably his masterpiece, and can be seen as the culmination of ideas first expressed in St. Elizabeth's 13 years earlier. St. Elizabeth's Church actually appears unfinished because the East Tower rises one level above its counterpart. The architect's plan originally called for spires on both towers. It is unknown why the second spire was not built. I came on the scene, and as I said, I was born in 1917. My first time, and I can faintly remember being brought to church by my mother and father from Sunday Mass. And then, of course, after. And then uh, we went to, when you got into school, then you went to Mass every morning. It was daily Mass, and the sisters would march us over to church. And, and so we spent, that was including Sunday. I mean, you had to report to your class on Sunday, too. So you were checked up on it. And, and uh, the sisters were working seven days a week, in other words. They, they earned their $25 a month salary. And when he, the last couple of years, I used to see him at as he'd be sitting out there on the porch. He was always sitting out there watching the children at recess. Is that right? Yeah, he was always, always waving his hand. and He, he was a good shepherd. Father Ossent celebrated his Silver Jubilee in 1918 and remained as pastor during St. Elizabeth's building years for 17 years until his death on March 20th 1923. He was survived by his sister, who was also his housekeeper, and his brother John, the organist. It's Austin John Austin, Father John Austin, the first pastor. His brother was the organist he in Quarter. He was still Quar around. Quar yeah, he was around. He lived over on 800 block of Milton Street. Mm -hmm. We used to call him Professor Austin. The Reverend Robert Gibberick, who was an assistant to Father Austin since 1921, was then appointed administrator of the parish. He continued in this service until May the 6th, 1925, when the Right Reverend Monsignor R.C. Roof was appointed as St. Elizabeth's second pastor. Although his pastorate was less than two years, Father Roof built an addition to the original convent. He also helped establish the Holy Family Parish within the boundaries of the former Camp Zachary Taylor, which had been abandoned by the army after World War I. On February the 9th, 1927, he left to become pastor of St. Elizabeth's parent church, St. Vincent de Paul. In Father Roof's place, Bishop John Flourish appointed the Reverend John F. Canoe from St. Columbia Church to St. Elizabeth's. At six feet, four and a half inches tall, and 275 pounds, Father Canoe was a big man with a big voice and a big heart. He was a tremendous communicator with a faith that could move mountains. His interest in youth was largely responsible for the increase in the school enrollment to more than 1,100. On the feast days, Christmas, Easter, 40 hours, and a few other ones, when they have a, a whole church, I mean, every pew in the place in the pew was filled with school children. The students took up the whole church, plus a couple of grades went up in the choir law. And then uh, the Father Canoe especially would bring all the boys into the sanctuary. 
was so packed in there you couldn't identify it. You just had to stay standing. But that was his idea. Every, Father Canoe was one who had you had to be big. In other words, everything had to be done in a big way, which was good because it, it really impressed a lot of people that certain occasions made a good impression on you. So he was a, he was a very active in that. A big man with a big heart and, a, and also big ideas. When he talked to you, it was fabulous. He was a big boom. He had a little little car. I'm not of this class. And he'd ride around down Burnett and then down Texas, and he'd pick children up and take them back to school if it was cold. He was just a kind, wonderful man. He was really great. Good memories. Yeah. I can remember as when I had started the first grade, we, um, my classroom was down in uh, next to Goody Hall. It used to be Goody's uh, uh, ice cream parlor, but uh, um, we had um, the backyard to play in, and I can remember sitting on the steps over here, the church steps, and Father uh, Canoe would come out, and all the children, and he would talk and joke with us and that. Always had ideas, and he always knew how it how was going to handle them. You know, he'd say, well, we're going to do this, and he'd stand on the pulpit, and he'd say, here's what we're going to do to get the money. I went to grade school here. I began as a six-year-old in 1933. And uh, just a typical Schnitzelberg kid, I was just a couple of blocks from the church and school. We would always walk, of course. We didn't have a car then, an automobile. And we would walk to school, bring our lunch. We couldn't afford to uh, buy our lunch here in the cafeteria because I was number four of eight children, all two years apart. And was uh, first communion, first confession here, uh, confirmation by Archbishop Flourish, who later ordained me, of course. And I wanted to go into the seminary out of the eighth grade, and Archbishop Flourish didn't care much for that because he had let a lot of the guys go, and uh, they didn't last very long, and it was just a lot of trouble, a lot of waste of money. So I kind of forgot about it and went down to St. X at 2nd and Broadway and was in the band. I was a bass drummer as I played in the band here at St. Elizabeth's, too, as a child. They gave me free lessons because I couldn't afford it to need somebody could take uh, the drum and keep good time, which is basically what I did. Well, Father Canoe was a great big man, and he did anything and everything for the children. He had, he got Dennis to come in here twice a year to come into the school. He had an office over there for them to go in. And he had every one of the school children's teeth examined by a dentist. And this was in the 30s. You know, that was unheard of. And we used to have a dentist, Dr. Tully, whose office used to be across the street at, on the corner. He would come here. We had our own dentist downstairs. Mm -hmm. And they would come here and do our teeth. It's, uh, it's amazing to, when you think about that. Right here on the, in the basement. He would work on our teeth and clean them and fill them and so on. So down in the behind, basement. Behind the altar, wasn't it? No, it was down, down in the basement. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Dr. King and Dr. Yates. Yeah. They didn't charge. We had free dental care when we were in grade school. And then they would send a card up to each classroom, call out your name, and you had to go have your teeth examined. And I had no way of getting out of it because my mom worked in the dental class. <laughs> She knew, she knew I wasn't absent that day. I was down there one day with a, oh, the name of Charles Linton, Chip Linton. We were out in Auburn Park, and I happened to get Dr. Yates that day, who sat in the, had the father's dentist chair back, but this boy Linton was in the other one. And uh, he got in there, and Dr. King says, open your mouth, and he opened his mouth. Dr. King picked up a big pair of scissors and he said, I got to take your tonsils out. Oh, he, was he, kidding. he was kidding him and that boy started running and he ran all the way to Audubon Park without stopping. He got home and mother said he thought he's going to die. <laughs> on a summer afternoon, he was here in the rectory. And there was a screen door on the front door and it was open because it was hot and didn't have air conditioning. And apparently they left it open. This fellow, this fellow young fellow came in and he said, somebody's going to rob him. Father Canoe said, no, young man, you don't want to do that. 
He picked him up by the collar and by the seat of his pants and threw him through the screen door. He didn't open the door, he threw him through. He landed <laughs> right on the porch. <laughs> so that was about the truth of it, too. An extensive athletic program was developed within the school and parish, and when it extended throughout the city, his influence in this field was widely recognized. He reached out to everyone, and he had a heart so big. He wanted everybody to have an education, go to school. I, I don't know whether everybody called him Pappy Canoe. I know all the kids called him Pappy Canoe. And he was a, uh, he was a big man. As I picture him, he was 6'6", um, six, six and I'm guessing 340, 50 pounds. He was a terrific, big, big, big man. He was, yeah. he'd tire over you, I guess. I guess he looked down at me, I looked like a little peanut. You did not miss Mace on Sunday. Matter of fact, we went to church every morning. We went to church every morning, and of course we were supposed to sing in the choir. I cannot sing. I'll sing if I'm just sitting behind a bunch of deaf people. But we had to sing sometime at the six o'clock mace. Even though I did not sing, I had to be down there. I learned to mouth all the songs. No one knew if I was singing or not. But, uh, but, but you know, we were more faithful to our church then. We had more things going on in church then the crown of the Blessed Mother and 40 hours and everything like that. It, it's different, it's, it's easier. Actually, our religion's easier, but uh, people don't abide by it anymore. All oh, big crowds, it ain't nothing like what it is now, this yeah. day and time. Because when you had something going on, it was, it was really big. Yeah. And it was enjoyable. Yeah. You never want to miss it. They had classrooms in the building that they got here, and then there was a convent that was next to that, and then there was a house before that store, which was Goody's store. That had a, that had a classroom in it. And then they went up here where, on the other side where the convent is now, or former convent. They had two buildings in the front, shotgun houses they made into class, two in the back and made into that. Had two classrooms above the sacristies and one above the garage. So they were all over everywhere. These things here, they sold them to Heitzman. The Heitzman moved them over behind the bakery there. And that's where they built the system. Those used to be houses now, and they turned them into they, classrooms. They, were classrooms here. they had classrooms all over there. They built a new garage, and they had a classroom over there. And then over the sacristy on each side of the church, they made classrooms up there. So we really had a. A large. Well, they built it yeah. down there, but next to Goody's they built yeah, yeah. that. Yeah. Had 90 they, boys in one room. They had that house next to Goody's. Yeah, right there. Yeah. Second grade, I remember we had our um, first communion, and uh, we I used my dress about three three times or four times at May processions in October rosary and uh, uh, like every one of the little girls that was in school, I was always hoping and keeping my fingers crossed that I would be one of them chosen to crown the Blessed Mother. His car turned over one time up Hickory and Lydia, and it had a couple of taverns up there at the time, and when he uh, had a big old Lincoln, it was, was a coupe, and uh, he had people, young, these fellas came out, taverns, you know, can we help you, Father? No, you go and get your beer and I'll drink my car. He just lift the car up, set it up upright on the four <laughs> wheels. <laughs> there was times that we could go home. The children could go home for lunch, and I, I was able to go home. But uh, uh, that was the only time I said that, and when I'd go to school, was I allowed to cross the street. My mother was very strict. <laughs> Father Canoe established the Catholic Students' Mission Crusade in St. Elizabeth's School, which gained national recognition. As with Fathers Ossent and Roof before him, Father Canoe celebrated the Silver Jubilee of his ordination in 1927. And like so many parish events, the Jubilee was immortalized on film using state-of-the-art photographic equipment at the time, the circuit camera. I had a camera, and the guy, it would, it would it rotate. And you could, some guy used to do this, you could get hair, and you could run around and be on the same picture. Yeah. It just went around, this, this guy had that camera, and it just rotated and took the whole thing. Bulky and finicky to operate, circuit cameras are large format rotational panorama cameras capable of photographing a view up to 360 degrees. The camera rotates on a special tripod, 
which has a large gear on its edge. The large gear engages a smaller pinion gear screwed into the underside of the camera body. A clockwork motor drives the pinion gear and also the film take-up drum so that as the camera rotates, film is pulled past a 7mm wide exposure slit. A common trick of the past was for people on the end of a group to appear twice in the photo. Once the camera passed them, they ran behind everyone else and joined in at the other end. But this most likely did not happen under the watchful eye of Father Canoe, who lined up children, parishioners, and priests alike to celebrate and document every major occasion in the parish. built a third floor in this rectory. I don't know why well, you were up there, you said. He built a third floor up in the rectory. And if you notice, when you get up there, it's just one big room. Well, he built that as a place for the teenagers to come and dance, to hold their dances. On the third floor of a rectory, well, I'd kick them out if I were... If they came up here at night and, and you know, I'm living down here and they're up there dancing, I sure, sure couldn't appreciate that, but that's the kind of guy he was. Father Canoe also had a very keen business sense, and perhaps even a sixth sense. Allegedly, days before the stock market crash of 1929, Father withdrew all the parish money and investments from the bank, thus saving the church from bankruptcy. And when Father Canoe was sent to Holy Trinity out in St. Matthews on Shelbyville Road, that's where St. Holy Trinity was at that time. And it broke Father Canoe's heart when they sent him to St. Matthews to Holy Trinity, but he obeyed. He just loved these people so much. He'd invested so much of his life here and you get attached to people. And it just broke his heart to be transferred. But uh, when we got a letter then from Archbishop Lurge, he went where he said, go, you went. To jump, you jump. Father Canoe went and put this, put this top on the record, and I always think that's the reason that uh, they never say it, but I think that's the real reason that Archbishop Flourish moved him. I told you, Father Canoe fixed up that third floor, you know, for the dance, and he got permission. You got to get permission from the Archbishop in those days to do anything, to spend any kind of money. So he got permission from the Archbishop to build this rec room up there on the third floor where he wanted to have ping pong tables and in addition to the dances, pool table and stuff like that. And in the back, he built a little suite of rooms, just real crampy, but a full bath. And the Archbishop came in here to examine it, to see it when it was finished. 
And he asked Father Canoe, what's that boobs back there? And Father Canoe said, that's where I'm going to live when I retire. The next day he got a letter and the mail said, I hereby assign you to St. To Trinity, Trinity Parish, Holy Trinity Parish. That was out in St. Matthews. Moved him right out of here. <laughs> he never did get to retire here. In 1938, he was transferred to Holy Trinity Church and again in 1945 to St. Vincent de Paul Church. But before he could take over his new assignment, death claimed Father Canoe on December the 9th, 1945. Before he got here, he was out in the country. An interesting point is he built a church out there with his own hands. Honest to God, put it up with the stones and the bricks and everything else. Now he had work, work from the help of his parishioners, but they didn't have a contractor. Canoe did all that stuff. He was uh, just a hard worker. Well, see, in those days, uh, everybody was, you, you, everybody behaved. There was no such thing as, as, as a distance problem. We did. Father Canoe was six foot four. He, 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 he probably picked you up. He took two guys one time in the schoolyard, picked them up, threw them together, put them together, threw them apart, and that, that corrected everybody. <laughs> I went up to visit the hospital in St. Joe's, and just a couple of nights before he died, I was visiting people in St. George, and I heard he was there, and so I stopped in to see him. Well, Miss Elizabeth was feeding him, and she, uh, so I said, I don't want to interrupt your meal. Oh, come on in, Clarence, she said, I'm not going to be around here long. So sit down and talk with me. He's just that way. 